Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is consideration of business motion 3554 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau uh, on change to this week's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. To press the request to speak button. I understand there is a member who may be wishing to press his request to speak button and therefore speak, and I understand that there may be a problem with the member's card. You got it? Thank you, Ms Mundell, and I call Oliver Mundell. Thank you. I thank Sorry. you, President Officer. I, I rise to highlight to Parliament... Sorry, Mr Mundell, I beg your pardon, please sit down. That, this has put me off my stride a wee, a wee smidgen. And I call, first of all, of course, on the Minister to move the motion. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. And I now call Oliver Mundell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I rise to highlight to Parliament, education stakeholders and the wider public my concerns about the way in which today's business has unfolded at short notice and without adequate explanation. Are we now really accepting that this SNP Government is so incompetent that it can't even organise the publication of its own so-called landmark education report? It may seem like small fry, but it speaks to the lack of ministerial oversight and incompetence that defined this SNP government's time in charge of our education system. Why should parents, teachers and young people trust them to turn things about and restore standards when they can't even get the basics right? Presiding officer, this follows the shambles in recent days at the SQA that has seen pupils screwed over for the third year in a row. I note uh, with gratitude the selection uh, of an urgent question this afternoon, but many outside will wonder why an extra half an hour statement opens up when it suits the Scottish Government. I accept that the timing of today's statement is unlikely to change, but it is important to put on record that this chaotic approach does nothing to build consensus and trust in Scottish education. Instead of a tired Government pushing the same tired arguments, we need a new approach that asks the difficult questions. We are not going to get that in a half an hour slot at the end of the day inserted at short notice. We again here see an SNP government who claim education is their top priority while at the same time selling our young people short. Where is the leadership? Where is the so-called priority? I would therefore be grateful if the Minister for Parliamentary Business could explain why we find ourselves in this absurd position and why there has been such urgency in bringing this matter forward when it has long been scheduled. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mundell. And I now call on George Adam, Minister, to respond. Thank you, President Officer. And uh, I would start by saying that uh, I can't be held accountable for the paranoia of the member himself. But this has been discussed in detail with the Bureau. The Bureau have discussed it. We have discussed it with all the business managers. And we have had a situation where this has been agreed. And uh, we will bring this forward now. Thank you. Uh, so the question is that motion 3554 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'll just ask that one more time. Are we all agreed? Yes. No members are in disagreement and therefore the motion is agreed. The next item of business is portfolio questions. And the first for portfolio questions is health and social care. And if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the re request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. Question number one, not lodged. Question number two, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Tayside in light of reports of the closure of GP practices. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government is aware of GP contracts and FECOM and Rye Hill practices in the NHS Tayside area. Uh, we will be handing back their contracts later this year. NHS Tayside is working with the respective health and social care partnerships to consider how best to ensure general medical services continue to be provided to patients registered with these practices once the contracts, is, once, once the contracts are handed back. Michael Mara. <laughs> 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I, I wrote to him on the 15th of February with Councillor Richard McCready um, and have yet to receive any response to address the concerns of local people in regards to the Rye Hill Health Centre. There's 5,400 patients um, who have been thrown into limbo. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary give any clarity on what happens next and where they will get their care? When will they know? But this closure flies in the face of the announcement the Health Secretary made in Dundee just two months ago about expanding GP provision. What new strategy can the Cabinet Secretary put in place to tackle declining access to services? Because what he has done so far clearly is not working. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, on the more specific point, is uh, of course we'll look into the correspondence that he and the local councillor uh, sent to me. I've also had correspondence uh, out of councillor uh, Bill Campbell in this respect, and I'll get him a response officially, uh, of course, uh, to that. Uh, he asked me about the next steps, and he's absolutely right uh, to do that. If he wishes, I will send him after this uh, question time details of who is best to contact in the Health and Social Care Partnership, but essentially uh, the Health and Social Care Partnership alongside the Health Board will assess the various different options. So they will look and, and are having active discussions, I should say, uh, with other GP practices, neighbouring GP practices, uh, to assess whether or not they can take on more patients, uh, but also what they will look to do to see is if, uh, if any practice has a desire and intention to take over uh, Rye Hill uh, practice. Uh, or indeed uh, frequent uh, practice, which I mentioned uh, earlier on as well. Uh, when a decision is made on how best to deliver uh, local uh, general medical services, then of course patients will also be informed directly uh, in that respect. On the more general uh, point, again, I can elaborate in more detail given uh, the time constraints that we are under, but this SNP government has uh, uh, an excellent record in investing in our GP services. That is why probably we have more GPs per 100,000 than anywhere else in the UK, 95 GPs per 100,000 in Scotland compared to 78 in England and 76 in Wales. So we will continue to invest in GP services. And on the more specifics, I am always happy to continue discussions uh, with the member, but he, I will make sure that he gets details uh, of the Health and Social Care Partnership are taking forward this matter. And supplementary, Sandish Gohani. Thank you, President Officer. On the subject of staffing crisis on NHS Tayside, BMA Scotland are highly concerned about consultant vacancies in Tayside. A Freedom of Information response shows vacancies are significantly higher than the figures released by the Scottish Government. Despite months of promises to recruit, no improvement has been made. When will the Scottish Government release accurate data and analysis about the extent of the problem in Tayside, and how does it intend to address the serious lapses in workforce planning? Well, a few points to make. I mean, the first, of course, is that we have record levels of staffing under this government, and in fact, medical and dental consultants uh, have increased considerably again under uh, this government. In terms of the Tayside specific issues, I met with Tayside chief executive and chair uh, just a, a number of weeks ago, and we discussed the issue uh, of consultant vac vacancies, in particular oncology uh, vacancies. We were looking to set up, and we have set up, in fact, a short life working group. Uh, in that regard. In terms of our future plans, uh, we will publish our national workforce strategy uh, later on this week. Question number three, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will meet with the Life After Ehir UK and Ireland support group to discuss its concerns about a lack of awareness and understanding of the reported physical, damaging physical and mental health impacts of Ehir sterilisation devices. Minister Marie Todd. Uh, yes, I would be happy to meet with the members of the Life After Leisure support group, and I am in the process of making arrangements. Sarah Boyack. Can I very much welcome the Minister's positive response to me today and say I hope the meeting is as soon as possible. A key issue that the women have raised with me is the lack of knowledge on the ground with their GPs. They recently met with the Northern Ireland Health Secretary, and following that meeting, every GP in Northern Ireland has now been sent a fact sheet and information about the crippling impact of the easier devices on those women's physical and mental health. So as soon as that information can get passed to our GPs, the sooner the better. So could the, uh, could the, health, um, could the health Minister say whether she would be prepared to consider that issue and see if we can accelerate getting that information out to our GPs across the country Minister. so that women can get that support? Minister. The member is absolutely correct. It is vitally important that there is a consistent approach and a clear treatment pathway for any woman experiencing complications as a result of this device. And once I have met with the affected woman, I will certainly the Scottish Government will, of course, consider whether any further action is needed on our part or by the NHS in Scotland, and that would include potentially writing out to them, or alternatively, um, other means of ensuring that there is increased awareness 
um, uh, where women are going to seek help for, um, with this device. A supplementary, Sue Weber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Although eShore was withdrawn from the UK market in 2017, it is estimated that up to 2,000 women were implanted with this device. Can the, the sec Health Secretary advise whether Scotland's he which of Scotland's health boards implanted the devices and whether the Scottish Government has considered the merits of writing to the individual and relevant GPs to raise awareness of the crippling and long-term side effects, given how busy the GP workload is? Minister. So certainly once I've met with the affected women, we will consider all options for ensuring that the appropriate people are informed about the concerns that are being raised. Um, I can give the uh, member assurance that about 700 women in Scotland were implanted with this device before it was withdrawn from the market um, in September 2017 rather than 2000. And certainly um, I can probably write to her I can write to her um, with details of which health boards were using this. I am keen to raise awareness of this issue right across the board and keen that women themselves are able to seek support and are able to have an appropriate response from Gen GPs when they do seek support with this issue. It is one of the important things we have seen it time and time again with women's health. It is one of the reasons that we are introducing the role of the Patient Safety Commissioner. We are very keen that women and uh, all patients are heard when concerns are raised about safety about devices and that appropriate action is taken. Question number four, Jenny Minto. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how decisions are made regarding the location of dialysis units. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> It is uh, the responsibility of NHS boards working with their local partners to plan service delivery and treatment in accordance with the needs of patients undergoing dialysis in their particular area. The location of renal services and associated satellite dialysis units are identified based on needs assessments of patients and where they live by the individual health boards. The Scottish Government fund the Scottish Renal Registry, which assists services to carry out audits in order to support improvements in service delivery and planning. Jenny Minton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, last Friday, I visited the recently opened dialysis unit in Rothsey, Isle of Bute. I want to pay tribute to my constituent, Hamish Kirk, who worked tirelessly with others to ensure the unit was set up following a donation. Sadly, Hamish died last month only benefiting from the new unit for a matter of weeks. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is important that the health and social care partnerships work with local groups and individuals to ensure that units like this one on Butte can be established? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I first uh, join Jenny Minto in paying uh, tribute to her constituent, Hamish Kirk? Uh, and I also want to send my sympathies uh, to his loved ones, his friends, but also uh, the local community too. And, and I agree wholeheartedly uh, with what Ms Minto has said. Uh, I think uh, the partnership uh, with the, the Butte Kidney Patient Support Group locally uh, has be, is, is, is an excellent example um, of NHS boards, the local health and care partnership um, and, and, and local community groups working really uh, closely uh, together. Uh, it's important that people undergoing dialysis can access care as close to home as possible, and that's why we continue to fund uh, those uh, satellite units. But can I pay tribute once again to her constituent, but also the great work that Butte Kidney Patient Support Group uh, have done? Question number five, Jackson Carnot. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the transvaginal mesh case review, record review led by Professor Alison Britton and the anticipated timescale for its completion. Minister Marie Todd. The review was established in February 2021 to look into the concerns that women had about the accuracy of their case records. Since then, Professor Britton has met with everyone who wishes to take part, and the panel are now starting to consider each woman's medical records alongside their concerns. A number of factors, including COVID-19, meant that the review has taken longer than we initially thought it would, but we do expect the review to conclude later this year. I hope that this will be a beneficial process for all involved. Jackson Carlow. I thank the Minister for her answer. In response to written questions I submitted on the review in September last year, the Cabinet Secretary informed me that commissioned contractor Clinco would request appropriate case records from health boards. At that point, data sharing agreements had been reached with some health boards for access to patient records, and he expected agreements to be in place for all relevant boards in the near future at that time. Almost six months on, can the Minister please confirm if all data sharing agreements are now agreed and whether every health board 
has made available all of the required and requested patient information. If not, can she advise what might be holding up this process? Minister. So, given the information being shared is so sensitive, we have worked really hard to ensure that there is a robust process in place for transferring patient records to the panel for review. And that has taken some time to finalise. But I am sure we all agree it is vitally important that patients' private information is kept safe and secure. I am pleased to report that all of these issues now appear to be resolved and that records are being received from the health boards requested. I am very grateful to the panel and particularly to the women taking part for their forbearance. Question number six, Joe Fitzpatrick. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to people at risk of alcohol harm in the most deprived communities. Minister Marie Todd. There is a stark social gradient to alcohol harms, so with alcohol-specific death rates in the most deprived areas 4.3 times more than those in the least, and seven times more likely to be admitted to hospital with alcohol-related conditions than those in the least deprived areas. We take a whole population approach to reducing alcohol consumption and risk of alcohol-related harms, driving reductions of alcohol harm in our most deprived communities. We are taking action to improve the conditions which drive alcohol harms and reducing poverty and inequalities, providing good quality affordable housing and enabling the best start in life for our children. Joe Fitzpatrick. Her for her response, and I know this is a, a, a particular area that she and I both have a particular interest in and are particularly keen to make progress on. The, the Minister um, mentioned the, the 4.3 times higher um, death rate in the most deprived areas in, in Scotland from alcohol-related deaths. Um, the Minister will also be aware of the report on alcohol problem management in deep-end practices serving the most deprived populations in Scotland, launched today by Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems, and that it shows the value and effectiveness of the primary care alcohol nurse outreach service in reducing alcohol harms. I wonder if the, the Minister could say whether she would, um, the Scottish Government would encourage all deep-end practices to adopt a similar model. Minister. Um, firstly, I'd like to commend Joe Fitzpatrick for his work in this area, both as Minister and as a backbench MSP. I know it's an area he cares deeply about and will continue to work hard on. Let me assure Mr Fitzpatrick the Scottish Government will carefully consider the findings of the report published today, which highlights the need for more research into the effectiveness of this, these services. We support person-centred approaches such as those provided by primary care, alcohol, <coughs> nurse, outreach services in deep end practices for alcohol treatment. And this is set out in our national strategies. The Scottish Government Mental Health Strategy 2017 to 22 and the National Alcohol and Drug Strategy Rights, Respect and Recovery. And supplementary, Faisal Chaji. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the group Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problem has recently highlighted the so called multiple disadvantage faced by BME people struggling with alcohol harm where cultural and other barriers only add to the barriers to the people from seeking treatment. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure everyone in our society can access the support they need? Minister. So this is a really key question and one that I am um, deeply interested in solving. The work with the DPEN practices, which um, today we are talking about their, their approach to um, tackling alcohol-related harm, but actually they do an incredible work um, at tackling inequalities and reaching those people in our society in Scotland who are often find it hard to access health care um, in, in, in our society. So I think there is a range of work going on right across the board, um, but I expect the deep end practice work will feature strongly in um, what uh, Mr Chowdhury describes, which is really intersectionality between different inequalities coming together and making life very difficult for those people who are experiencing it. Question number seven, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of International Women's Day, whether it will provide an update on its action to improve health and reduce inequalities for women in Scotland, as outlined in the Women's Health Plan. Minister Marie Todd. Implementation of the Women's Health Plan is underway, and in October last year we launched NHS Form uh, Inform Menopause Information Platform. That is the first stage in the development of a comprehensive women's health information platform. 
Work is also underway to develop information and resources for girls and women on starting periods, managing symptoms, choosing contraception, planning for pregnancy, which will all be added to the platform. In spring this year, we will publish an implementation plan, setting out in more detail how the actions will be implemented, and our first progress report will be published in autumn this year. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the Minister for that answer. One of my constituents contacted me recently to say her endometriosis pain has resulted in her permanently closing her hair salon in Dune. She welcomes the Women's Health Plan and its specific focus on endometriosis research and reductions in diagnosis time. Can the Minister please give an update on the work being done, particularly to improve the lives of endometriosis sufferers across Scotland? Minister. So endometriosis is a high priority for government, and we have a, a whole range of work underway to improve the experience for women. We are working with NHS Inform to update the endometriosis pages with accurate, up-to-date information and a lived experience video. We are aiming to provide additional resources to school-aged children, to teachers, to parents and carers by working with the National Resource for Relationships, Sexual Health and Parenthood. We funded Endometriosis UK £15,000 to raise awareness and to support those waiting diagnosis. The Centre for Sustainable Delivery has developed an endometriosis care pathway to individualise treatment, to improve earlier intervention and to streamline referrals to secondary and to tertiary care. Mm -hmm. And we will deliver more opportunities for training on endometriosis for healthcare professionals. We are also developing networks to coordinate endometriosis care to help to provide equitable, equitable access to support and care for women right across Scotland. Our supplementary, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. We know that endometriosis symptoms can start in puberty and it's a horrible thing for young people to be going through. Um, Minister, menstrual wellbeing education was made compulsory in England in 2020 and in Wales at the end of 2021. And Scotland is the only place in Great Britain that currently it, where it is not mandatory. So will the minister commit to introducing compulsory menstrual education in Scottish schools? Minister. So, Ms Hamilton will be aware that, that um, the very, very little in the education system um, in the curriculum in Scotland is mandatory. We tend not to work that way. We tend to work with local authorities and ensure that there is a broad range in curriculum and that children are able to access a broad range of education. We have, however, as I alluded to in my, in my previous answer, we absolutely have worked on resources for RSHP and um, those additional resources sources are available to school-aged children, their teachers, their parents and their carers um, to utilise um, to improve the level of awareness, absolutely vital area of improving our um, work on endometriosis. A supplementary, Carmel. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Pertinent to the Women's Health Plan being a success is the proper functioning of maternity wards across the country. The Minister will be aware that there was a failure of telephone systems at Cross House Hospital in East Ayrshire over the weekend, including reports that this impacted the line to the maternity unit. Could the Minister update Parliament on what was described as a major incident by the Health Board and set out how the Government have responded? Uh, before you answer, I appreciate that is a bit wide of the question uh, and it really is supposed to be a supplementary to the question that is in the Business Bulletin. But if the Minister wishes to say uh, a few words in response, that would be fine. Certain, certainly, I am more than happy to get an update to the Member. I know that the, um, certainly the reports I heard over the weekend and on Monday about that particular incident was that there was an extremely rapid response to it and that there were, it was a strong test of the mutual aid um, systems which are in place um, at this moment in time when the NHS is under the greatest pressure it has ever endured. And actually the initial reports were that there was um, really good support from the health boards around um, the area that experienced that particular critical failure. Question number eight, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress it is making to reduce waiting times for children's mental health services. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government has provided record-breaking levels of investment, including our £120 million mental health recovery and renewal fund. 
As part of that work, we have made an additional £40 million available to improve child and adolescent mental health services, with £4.25 million of that specifically dedicated to clearing waiting list backlogs by March 2023. We are working closely with all the NHS boards, particularly those uh, with the most significant performance challenges, to develop and implement detailed local improvement plans that will deliver the CAM specification, clear backlogs and meet targets. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the Minister for that answer. Alternative pathways that provide early interventions for children and young people's mental health at an early stage can prevent mental health issues becoming more serious and reaching crisis point. What steps is the Scottish Government taking to address the difficulties currently faced by children and families wishing to access alternative mental health services and also to ensure mental health care can be stepped up or down between tiers two and three without losing the child's place on any waiting lists? Minister. Uh, President officer, uh, we are committed to improving uh, access to community mental health and wellbeing support for our children and young people and their families and carers. Uh, in this financial year, uh, we have provided local authorities with an additional £15 million to fund over 230 new and enhanced supports and services for children and young people. Uh, this funding gives local partnerships the flexibility uh, to implement services on the basis of local priorities, with a focus on prevention and early intervention, and as an alternative for those for whom CAMS is not suitable. Um, local authorities have advised us, President Officer, uh, that nearly 18,000 children and young people access the community-based services between July and December last year, with more than 800 referrals into the services being made by health professionals, which is, uh, I'm sure everyone would agree, encouraging to note. And I have uh, three supplementaries I intend to take all three. First from Craig Hoy. Deputy Presiding Officer, amid soaring CAMS waiting times, Public Health Scotland uh, figures show that uh, antidepressant medication was prescribed to uh, 20,825 children aged up to 19 and 29 in 2020. This is an increase of more than 80 per cent in a decade and a trebling of those aged 10 to 14. Can the Minister say what assessment the Government is undertaking to look into the root cause of this and to ensure that young people aren't being put on pills when they should be setting out on more positive or preventative pathways? Uh, again, could I, before the Minister responds, again, I, I, I do wish to stress members that supplementaries are supposed to be supplemental to the question in the Business Bulletin. And I'm just making that point. The Minister uh, could perhaps answer briefly uh, in, in as so far as the question relates to the question that's actually on the Business Bulletin. Thank you. Um, President officer, I think we have to all be careful around about how we describe these situations, because we do not want to stigmatise these young folk. Uh, and beyond that, I think we have to trust our clinicians um, who will do every everything uh, right and proper uh, to ensure that people are treated well. I'm more than happy to have a discussion out with the Chamber with Mr Hoy about these issues, but I would plead with everyone in the chamber to be very, very careful about use of language when it comes um, to uh, the prescription of drugs, please. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Uh, 392 young people were waiting over two years for mental health care. One young person in NHS Grampian was waiting for 2,534 days. That's six years and 11 months for their care to begin. We get endless promises with this government, but the waits seem to be never ending. So by when can young people expect a decent and timely mental health service? Minister. Um, President officer, um, I agree with Mr Rennie that um, some of these waits are completely and utterly unacceptable. And that's why we're making the investment that we are in clearing backlogs and waiting lists. Uh, but beyond that, um, you know, and I'm sure Mr Rennie will agree with us because we've had conversations uh, previously about this. The best way of dealing with this is to try and stop folk from having to use acute services in the first place by getting um, the community investment right and 
uh, preventative spend uh, right. Uh, but our ambition, as I laid out earlier in my answer to uh, uh, Stephanie Callaghan, um, is to clear backlogs by March 2023. Um, as the Chamber can uh, probably well understand, uh, my um, efforts, the government's efforts in, uh, in the main, are targeted at those uh, health boards um, that have had backlogs which existed prior to the pandemic, which have been exacerbated, uh, and we will continue to do that. And I can squeeze in a brief supplementary from Jackie Bailey with hopefully a brief response. Thank you. Thank you. The latest CAMS workforce data shows that there were 190 whole-time equivalent vacancies at the end of 2021. That's double the vacancy rate in 2019. So does the Minister accept that CAMS waiting times will not be reduced if the government doesn't get serious about tackling workforce planning? So can he say how many more CAMS staff and when? Uh, what Minister. I would say to uh, Ms Bailey, President Officer, is that we are in the process of workforce expansion at this moment in time, and there will be vacancies that we have to fill to ensure that we uh, reach uh, that expanded level. We have provided sufficient funding uh, for a minimum of 320 additional CAM staff over the next five years. Uh, and the government, with agreement uh, with uh, a number of health boards, to ensure that we get this recruitment right for the first time ever has been recruiting uh, on a national basis to ensure that we can get those uh, new uh, workers into our CAM services right across the country. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, portfolio questions on health and social care. And I will allow a very short pause before we move on to the next portfolio, which is social justice, housing and local government in order that front benchers may change seats if they wish. Thank you. Point of order, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. This afternoon, the government have approached for a ministerial statement in relation to a report that was due that is due to be published later today, although it was originally due to be due to be published today, but came yesterday. On social media, there are elements of this report already circulating, and I would seek your advice on how those within this chamber can have the same advantage as those that sit outside to see the report before the Minister makes the statement. I thank Mr Whitfield for his point of order. I have not had a chance yet to see the report or these reports of the report, and we will reflect and consider the terms of these uh, matters and revert to the chamber later if that is in order. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next portfolio uh, questions is social justice, housing and local government. And I remind members that questions five and seven are grouped together and that I'll take any supplementaries on these questions once both have been answered. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should uh, press the request to speak button or uh, they should uh, enter R in the uh, chat function during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its housing strategy will support local authorities to take action in relation to vacant, de vacant derelict and abandoned buildings. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Our Housing to 2040 strategy recognises the importance of tackling vacant properties and highlights the range of actions. These include support to local authorities through empty homes partnerships, the use of 50 million uh, vacant and derelict land investment programme, and supporting the delivery of homes in town centres and at the heart of communities by repurposing existing properties. And of course, our affordable housing supply programme already supports the redevelopment of existing properties. And during the second half of our 110,000 affordable homes target, we will accelerate funding to bring more existing homes into the programme as well as building new ones. Emma Harper. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Scotland has almost 11,000 hectares of vacant and derelict sites. That's equivalent to 20,556 football pitches. In my South Scotland region, we have the George Hotel in Stranraer, Interfloor Factory in Dumfries, and the NPO Building in Hoyk, and many others. And the Land Commission stated that these sites have a detrimental impact on community health and well-being. Given that March is Land Reuse Month, can the, Minister provide, can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on what additional steps the Scottish Government can take to help communities better deal with vacant, derelict and abandoned buildings? Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
So I, I can tell Emma Harper that um, the draft uh, NPF 4 um, proposes a stronger planning policy position on tackling vacant and derelict land and buildings, which will play an important role in helping to support improved wellbeing for local communities. In addition, we launched our Low Carbon Vacant and Derelict Land Investment Programme last year, which aims to help tackle persistent vacant and derelict land. Uh, the fund is built around uh, four uh, pillars of action, urban green spaces, community-led re regeneration, low-carbon housing and renewable energy. And the fund will open for stage one applications in April and all local authorities are eligible to apply. Supplementary, Alexandra Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, the Local Government and Communities Committee recommended the introduction of compulsory sale orders back in 2019. Despite being included in the latest SNP manifesto, there appears to be very little movement on this issue. Therefore, Cabinet Secretary, can you update Parliament on the plans to introduce compulsory sales orders? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I can tell the member that we are developing proposals for compulsory sales orders and compulsory purchase orders in the context of the actions and policies set out in Housing to 2040. Officials are undertaking uh, a piece of uh, work to scope and clarify the additional benefit of CSOs over and above the CPO process. There are some issues and challenges which need to be worked through to ensure, for example, that the sales process is compatible uh, with the Euro European Convention on Human Rights. I'm sure the member will appreciate that. The introduction of new powers, of course, has to be considered carefully, particularly if existing powers could be used to achieve the same outcome. But that work is ongoing, and I'm happy to keep the member updated. And supplementary, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. With lots of people homeless in Glasgow, um, there are 2,659 residential properties currently vacant on a long-term basis, plus hundreds of square feet of vacant commercial buildings that could be converted into residential properties if there was a will to do so. But often the VAT arrangements militate against that because VAT on residential conversions and adaptions are charged at 20 per cent, whereas for demolition and new build it is zero per cent. Would the government make representations to the Treasury to deal with this issue at source, but also potentially consider a VAT offsetting scheme for Scotland so we can actually move forward and get retrofitting underway at scale? Cabinet Secretary. So, obviously, as Paul Sweeney has recognised, VAT is, is a reserved matter, but I'm happy to hear more about his suggestion if he wants to write to me with more details. Always happy to consider uh, suggestions. I think what I laid out in my initial answers, though, is, is a, a determination to look at vacant and derelict land and also buildings that have uh, that need to be repurposed. I'm really keen that we use our collective resources across government to do that very much in recognition of the need to make sure that we um, have the affordable housing supply programme and we do everything we can to enhance that but also to regenerate some of our town centres. So happy to um, hear more details of what Paul Sweeney was suggesting. Question number two, Emma Roddick who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for an update on allocation of discretionary housing payments in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. So we estimate spend on discretionary housing payments to be £82 million pounds in 2021-22, up from £71 million pounds budgeted for in 2020-21. Of this, £71 million pounds mitigates the bedroom tax in full, helping over 92,000 households in Scotland to sustain their tenancies. An additional £10.9 million pounds mitigates against the damaging impact of other UK government welfare cuts, including the benefit cap and changes to the local housing allowance rates. We estimate the DHP budget to be £79 million in 2022-23. Of this, £68.1 million pounds will be used to continue to mitigate the bedroom tax. Emma Roddick. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recent figures from the UK government on equivalent discretionary housing payments in England and Wales show that, remarkably, their total spend on DHPs adds up to only slightly more than payments in Scotland. Would the Cabinet Secretary join me in expressing frustration that Scotland is forced to spend a proportionately enormous sum in order to offset regressive Tory policies like the bedroom tax, when we could instead be using those funds to actively and progressively build a fairer, greener future? Cabinet Secretary. I would certainly agree with Emma Roddick that it's frustrating that the UK government plans to spend £100 million on discretionary housing payments for all of England and Wales 
in 2022-23, while the Scottish Government will spend £80 million to mitigate the impact of cuts to the welfare system. And that we need to spend this money at all shows that the UK welfare system is not fit for purpose. And if we didn't have to mitigate UK Government policies imposed on us, we could further invest in measures to tackle the priorities of this Parliament, including poverty. And I would appeal again for the UK Government to get rid of the bedroom tax at source. And supplementary from Paul O'Kane, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can clarify what has been done uh, to raise awareness of the Tenant Grant Fund and ensure that tenants in need of help with rent arrears are able to access that support as soon as possible. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say to Paul O'Kane that we have been working with local authorities and third sector partners to make sure that the awareness of the Tenant Grant Fund is a, as, as extensive as it can be. And we can continue to do that because it is an important fund, particularly uh, in these difficult times of rising uh, living costs. So uh, we will continue to, to raise awareness and encourage people to apply. Question number three, Sue Weber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the comments by the President of COSLA, who said that local authorities are at breaking point. Minister Ben McPherson. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are uh, living through very serious times and no one underestimates the challenges facing public services. But I think it is also important to note uh, for context that when the Scottish Fiscal Commission have evidenced that the overall Scottish budget for 2022-23 reduced by 5.2% in real terms. The Scottish Government increased local government funding by over £1 billion for next year, a real terms increase of 6.3%. Uh, however, the Scottish Government will continue to meet and crucially collaborate with COSLA and local authorities on a regular basis to ensure that the people of Scotland uh, continue to receive the high quality public services that they expect. Sue Weber. I thank the Minister for his answer. The City of Edinburgh Council plans to borrow £1 billion to fund city spending over the next four years. Borrowing during rising interest rates will be a difficult balancing act that will bring with it significant financing risk. Does the Scottish Government agree that it is their own persistent underfunding of local authorities that leads to councils like Edinburgh having to take such high-stake financial risks? Minister. I think it is, again, for context, important to recognise that in 2022-23, the City of Edinburgh Council will receive £915.4 million to fund local services, which equates to an extra £86.7 million to support vital day-to-day -day services, or an additional 10.5 per cent compared to 2021-22. Uh, there are, of course, uh, considerations as we move forward with local government finance, which I am sure the member will wish to speak to finance ministers about, uh, for example, um, considerations around the funding formula. Uh, this will, of course, uh, require uh, engagement with COSLA because uh, the Scottish Government is always open to suggestions to improve the funding formula. However, proposals uh, must properly come through COSLA in the first instance. And, of course, we continue to uh, collaborate with our, our colleagues in local government on the development of a, of a fiscal framework. I think it would be more helpful if uh, Conservative members could come to this chamber, uh, of course, legitimately with concerns, uh, that, is, that is their prerogative, but perhaps with some solutions for a change would also be helpful. Thank you. And supplementary from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, how credible is it for the Tories to complain about local government funding in Scotland when the UK Government of England has cut local authority funding by 37 per cent in real terms over the last decade? And can you ever envisage a situation in Scotland where a local authority would close five children's centres like Labour-run Nottingham City Council did this week due to Tory cuts? Minister. Well, I, I think uh, Mr Gibson, as he always does, makes very important points in this area, and I think he helps set uh, important context in this regard. because. While uh, local government funding in Scotland and England is not wholly comparable, and we need to be uh, candid and honest about that, the local government association set out in their 2021 spending review submission on the 5th of October that English councils had already dealt with a £15 billion real terms reduction to core government funding between 2010 and 2020. Uh, and I think that underlines the answer that I gave in my first answer to, to Sue Weber. Uh, that what the Scottish Government has provided in the next financial year 
uh, is significantly more beneficial than those uh, councils south of the border. Question number four, Liam Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with local government regarding support that it can provide in order to maintain local authority frontline services. Minister Ben McPherson. Uh, ministers meet uh, with COSLA and also individual local authorities on a regular basis to cover a range of issues, uh, including support for, for frontline services. And I will meet the, the COSLA presidential team um, very soon uh, as part of our, our monthly engagements. Uh, also, following the announcement of the Scottish Budget on the 9th of December, uh, the First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy and the Cabinet Secretary for Local Justice on separate occasions met with the COSLA leadership team uh, and council leaders to discuss the impact of the budget on the 2022-23 local government settlement. Um, councils in that process asked for an additional £100 million to deal with uh, particular pre pressures. Uh, we heard them, we listened uh, and we went further by providing £120 million at stage two of the budget bill. Uh, Liam Kerr, a point of order. Yes, sorry, I should have declared, but prior to my question, that I am a, a councillor at the City of Edinburgh. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Weber, and I've slightly lost my place. Liam Kerr, I think, has another shot. Yes, thank Kerr. you, Presiding Officer. The Minister mentions the budget. Well, Aberdeenshire Council's budget grant this year is nearly £45 million less than the Scottish average. And even with a proposed council tax rise, they are nearly £15 million in the red. Now, across Scotland, the impact that the Minister refers to of these cuts is on public toilets, music tuition in schools, bus services, and so much else that directly impacts people's lives. And no amount of window dressing and spin from the Minister will bring back the countless services people depend on which have had to be axed. So will the Minister demand that his government review the non-ring-fenced funding allocation to Aberdeenshire Council, finally give a fair share to the North East so they can support the services that people depend on. Yeah. Minister. Well, again, uh, for, for context, in 2022-23, Aberdeenshire Council will receive uh, £521.3 million to fund local services, which equates to an extra £44 million pounds to support vital day-to-day -day services, uh, or an additional 9.2 per cent compared to 2122. Uh, Mr. Kerr uh, refers to um, the Aberdeenshire Council in, in particular. And again, I would, if, if members are, are, are looking to see changes for particular uh, local authority areas, then they need to consider that the local government needs based formula used to distribute the quantum of funding available for local government is, is kept under constant review, as you would expect, uh, but it crucially is agreed with COSLA on behalf of all 32 local authorities each year. Uh, the Scottish Government is always open to suggestions to improve the funding formula. However, as I have said previously this afternoon, uh, proposals must properly come through COSLA in the, in the first instance. Uh, there is an ongoing engagement between uh, local government and COSLA in a constructive manner around uh, ring fencing and flexibilities, and we look forward to continuing that constructive engagement in the period ahead. Supplementary, Audrey Nicol. Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest. Local government financial returns for 2020 show Aberdeen has the highest debt per head of, of population anywhere in Scotland. So for every Aberdeen resident, this stands at £4,954 per head, the next highest council being West and Bartonshire. Local government funding is vital to ensure the delivery of frontline services, and debt is a normal aspect of funding arrangements. However, debt not only has to be serviced, but it has to be repaid. Does the Minister agree with me that it is absolutely vital that local authorities exercise prudent and responsible management of budgets that prioritise the delivery of key services over tempting big spending opportunities? Minister. Prudence in, in the public finances is, of, of, of course, uh, of particular importance to all, all in government. Uh, and I, I think uh, Audrey Nicholl makes uh, important points with regard to uh, Aberdeen City Council, but also uh, more widely uh, with, with local authority finance. And uh, I, I will take a note of, of, of uh, the points that have been raised today, uh, but also I uh, would encourage the member to uh, engage with my colleagues in, in the finance team uh, on the matters raised. A supplementary, Jackie Bailey. Does the Minister accept that local government cannot function well when demoralised staff are being offered a further real terms cut in their pay? 
Does the Minister believe that it is acceptable for those on the lowest wages to be offered a few hundred pounds, while senior officers are offered a cost of living increase in the order of £2,000? And what will the Minister do about it? Minister. First of all, I, in, in answer to this question, I would want to put on the record again the, the, the Scottish Government Minister's admirations uh, of and gratitude for all of the all of the effort and contributions that have been made by local authority uh, staff members throughout the pandemic and recent periods and, and having uh, worked for a local authority in uh, one of those roles previously I know uh, how hard they work. Uh, uh, Ms Bailey will know that these are points of engagement that finance ministers are, are uh, in, in conversations with uh, on a regular basis uh, and uh, of course these are matters that we discuss uh, with COSLA and local authorities individually uh, and we will continue to engage on these important points. Question number five, Maggie Chapman. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what support is available, including through local authorities, to provide accommodation in communities for people displaced by conflict or climate change. Cabinet Secretary. The support available uh, varies depending on the person's status. People arriving through the UK refugee resettlement programmes are usually supported by local authorities, having been matched with housing identified by the local authority prior to arrival. All 32 of Scotland's local authorities have supported refugee resettlement. People arriving in the UK through a visa programme are usually responsible for finding their own accommodation and may be restricted from accessing local authority housing or housing benefit by conditions set out in the UK Government Reserve Immigration Legislation. And people seeking asylum are restricted from accessing council housing or housing benefit and must apply for home office support and accommodation if they would otherwise be destitute. And finally, both we and COSLA have made clear to the UK Government that Scotland stands ready to play our part and we absolutely are committed to continue to support people who may be displaced, providing support from day one of arrival. Maggie Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. I have asked in this chamber before about the problem of what is becoming by stealth institutional accommodation for single men asylum seekers in hotels across Scotland. Many of these men have been in hotels without proper support or community for many, many months. Today I want to ask what we can learn from the failures of the Afghan evacuation scheme that has, been, that, that has seen resettled families end up in bridging hotels for many months. Recent figures suggest 12,000 people are still stuck in limbo, not yet moved into settled accommodation. Once again, the dysfunctional Home Office has let refugees down. We know that institutional accommodation, like hotels, are not homes. They are not places where people can find safety, sanctuary and start to rebuild their lives. As we look to create routes to safety for Ukrainian refugees, how do we ensure this does not happen for future resettlement schemes, such as what we would want in place for people from the Ukraine? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I say, my, Maggie Chapman makes a number of really important points. That the Scottish Government is clear that refugees and people seeking asylum must be treated fairly and with dignity and respect at, at all times. Integration should be supported from day one and people should be accommodated in the community with the support they need to rebuild their lives. The current situation with thousands of people in hotels across the UK is a reflection of the UK Government's failing asylum and resettlement systems, which will, of course, become worse under the Nationality and Borders Bill. Uh, unfortunately, the UK Government's response so far to the current Ukrainian humanitarian crisis has shown that lessons have not been learned and that we need a comprehensive settlement programme that focuses on people's needs and ensures partnership with the Scottish Government, local authorities, the third sector and, importantly, with communities. Question number seven, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its plans to resettle Ukrainian refugees in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland has a proud history of welcoming refugees and people seeking asylum. The Scottish Government and Scotland's local authorities have made clear to the UK Government that they stand ready to offer refuge and sanctuary where necessary for those who may be displaced. The UK Government's current proposals to support Ukrainian refugees via community sponsorship are insufficient and the Scottish Government continues to call on the UK Government to act now and develop a comprehensive resettlement programme. The Scottish Government is working with the Home Office, COSLA, local authorities and other partners to provide people with the safety and security they need to rebuild their lives. Alex Go Hamilton. Secretary for that reply. 
Uh, since the beginning of the war two weeks ago, the Home Office has issued fewer than 1,000 visas to Ukrainian refugees under the early schemes that it has announced. Desperate families fleeing for their lives are meeting cruel barriers set by an unwelcoming government. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the best way for us in Scotland to convince the UK government to help those in need of refuge is for Scotland to demonstrate that we are ready to provide everything people fleeing that conflict may need, including homes, education, translation and trauma services? In particular, will she describe how those offering second homes and room in their own accommodation can do so? And has the Scottish Government completed necessary readiness assessments both with this Parliament and the UK Government to help drive this forward? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, first of all, on the, the fact that the UK government has issued fewer than a, a thousand visas is frankly embarrassing in the situation, um, given the scale of the response from other countries uh, across Europe. Many of them actually quite, you know, a lot uh, poorer uh, than, than ours in terms of uh, accommodating and opening their doors. And I think, as the first minister has said, you know, we should uh, be allowing people in and then sort the paperwork. After. But um, despite that, we are working apace to make sure that we are ready and stand ready to receive uh, people on the assumption that the UK government's position cannot hold uh, and that work is ongoing. In terms of the response from the community, um, work is also ongoing to try and coordinate that because people do want to help. Uh, so, um, in terms of a, you know, a, a place, a single place where people can offer support, some of which can be utilised, some of which may not be able to be utilised for, uh, for good reasons. And the Scottish Refugee Council is going to be a critical um, agency in terms of uh, that immediate uh, first place support, and we're working with them to help them scale up. A supplementary, Eleanor Grissom. The Cabinet Secretary will recognise the immense outpouring of empathy and willingness from citizens right across Scotland to provide assistance and shelter in response to the humanitarian plight of Ukrainians fleeing the Russian invasion. In my own constituency, there are several efforts in progress right at the moment to take refugees in, to their own homes um, in local areas. But as we do not have border controls, can the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on discussions that are taking place with the United Kingdom Government to cut the red tape and get folk here? Cabinet Secretary. We are in regular discussion with the UK Government about this, as you can imagine, and there is, as I have said already, a, a need for a sizeable government-led resettlement programme that is up to the scale of the task, and we are continuing to urge the UK Government to take that action. The First Minister has written to the Prime Minister, uh, urging the UK Government to waive all visa requirements for any Ukrainian national seeking refuge in the UK and to offer immediate refuge and sanctuary for all those who may be displaced. We have to stand in solidarity. We need to be ready, and as I have said earlier, we stand ready with that uh, practical support, aid and sanctuary where necessary for those who need it. And I will be able to, to take questions six and eight if I could get brief questions and answers, please. Question number six, Megan Gallagher, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported concerns expressed by homeowners over the delay to help residents in homes with unsafe cladding. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we appreciate this is a difficult time for affected homeowners, and my officials are in regular contact as we progress our pilot programme of work. Within that programme, there are multiple surveys ongoing. These reports will be finalised in the coming weeks and will allow us to understand what actions need to be taken to further support homeowners in these buildings. We have to assess buildings first to ensure that the complex engineering requirements of each building can be addressed appropriately, and we continue to urge developers to play their part where construction is found to be unsafe and remain in discussions with the UK Government regarding what their plans are for their £4 billion developers fund. Megan Gallagher. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. In August, the Scottish Government announced a pilot scheme to assess the number of affected buildings with three tests to be carried out on 25 different apartment blocks. However, not one survey has been completed despite this being launched six months ago. Cabinet Secretary, the lack of progress here in Scotland could be putting people who live in these types of buildings under severe risk. So can the Cabinet Secretary give reassurances today as to when these, service, these surveys will be completed and when the findings will finally be published? Cabinet Secretary. 
Oh, can I reiterate what I said earlier in my initial answer, that there are multiple surveys ongoing. They are complex, given the engineering issues that, and the specialist skills required. The, re some, uh, the reports will be finalised in the coming weeks, and that will allow us to then look at which buildings can be deemed safe, but also, importantly, which buildings will require the remedial uh, action to be taken. And, of course, the, the £97 million that, um, is there will go some way towards that, but we absolutely need clarity from the UK Government about the consequentials and uh, on the developers' levy. My Welsh counterpart and I have written to the Secretary of State for Housing, calling for our governments to be part of any discussions with developers and its impact on our countries, because we do not have the powers to institute a developer tax or compel UK developers to contribute to a, scond a, a fund in Wales or Scotland. So we need the UK Government to clarify whether or not we are going to be part of that. And so far, we have no clarification. And question number eight, Miles Briggs. Government, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support ending of homelessness and rough sleeping in Edinburgh. Cabinet Secretary. We have provided the City of Edinburgh Council with £6.3 million to date to develop and implement its rapid rehousing transition plan, including funding for Housing First for around 170 people with multiple and complex needs. In addition, we have provided over £600,000 to establish a rapid rehousing welcome centre for people at risk of rough sleeping and over £21,000 of flexible emergency funding to frontline homelessness organisations. That is in addition, of course, to delivering new homes, uh, which is why, since 2007, Edinburgh has received £558 million through our affordable housing supply programme funding, and in this parliament will benefit from nearly £234 million. 5,147 people registered as homeless in the capital, 1,505 children in temporary accommodation. Edinburgh is facing a homelessness and housing crisis, yet is being shortchanged by £9.3 million due to a bureaucratic anomaly. Now, I have raised this with the Cabinet Secretary and various SNP ministers and still have not received an answer or a solution. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she will urgently agree to meet with myself, representatives from across the capital and Edinburgh City Council leaders to fix this situation and to give the capital the resources we need to end homelessness? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let me just say to, to Miles Briggs that the majority of funding that local authorities receive for tackling homelessness is provided through the annual local government finance settlement. The distribution of the local government settlement for 2022-23 was discussed and agreed with COSLA, and the City of Edinburgh Council will receive its fair formula share. Um, we remain open uh, to uh, looking at uh, whether or not that needs to change. But in terms of the £9.3 uh, million, pounds, uh, he will be aware that that is because of the choices that the City of Edinburgh Council have made in terms of where homelessness services sit. And it's for them to decide whether or not they change that, not for the Scottish Government to decide whether or not they change that. That is a decision for local decision makers and something Miles Briggs should really discuss with them if he thinks they should be delivering their homelessness services separately and differently. Right, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes uh, portfolio questions and there will be a very short pause before we move to the next item of business. Thank you.